think some things are beginning to cultivate in the kingdom. I have, uh, last three or four months, I've been on the road a lot and ministering at different places and, and seeing what's going on and seeing the state of the body. And, and with the school, I'm constantly getting emails from all over the world and ministering to ministers and saints alike. And in, in the series I did just last month of preparing for 2013 and beyond, one of the things that God said was that this next coming revival is not a revival like we, we think a revival. It's an individual revival that God is going to touch us, that God is going to restore us, and that as he does it on an individual level, that is just me and God, that as he gets that established, then those that are of kindred hearts are going to begin to, to come together. Those that have embraced darkness are going to begin to come together. How many know that probably never in, in, in the history of, of the nation, as far as I know, at least since 1900, I don't think there's been a clear choice in politics right now. And I, I think there's, there's becoming a place where there's not a clear choice in the church. There's not a clear choice in so many areas of life because God is saying, I'm getting ready to separate some things so that you can make a choice. If everything's gray, it's kind of hard to, to choose. And uh, I want to be prepared for what God's getting ready to do. And I'm starting a new series this morning called New Wineskins. And, uh, Lord, we need them. We need them. Uh, I look back over the last 17 years, and uh, it's been a scary ride. And I, I've shared this before, how that before we moved to Marshville, we were ministering to people coming out of multi-generational Satanism. We had assassins after us. Mary and I have been poisoned. We've been chased on the highways. We've uh, just all kinds of crazy things. And when, when you're in mission mode, it's, it's like you're not necessarily, you know, it's, it's the, the, the soldier doesn't have the problem during the combat. He has the problem after the combat's over. PTSD. And we went through a lot of things. We, we've, had, uh, we've had a lot of people come through in Dixon and come through in here that, that had many other agendas except for the kingdom of God. And I see that all across the body of Christ. Did you know that every week in America... 200 ministers walk away from ministry never to go back again. The sheep have eaten them up. And you can also flip that, that right now, if we could just have the people that were wounded that have left church, there, could, there wouldn't be a building or a stadium big enough to hold them all. We, ha we have had sheep destroyed by shepherds, and we have had shepherds destroyed by sheep, all because things are amiss in the kingdom. We've gotten things all mixed up. And uh, God began ministering to me this week. And uh, guys, I, I need it just as much as you do. I, I want God to move. I want God to do some things. And to be truthful with what we have went through in the last 17 years, I'm not as patient as I used to be. I'm a little bit more grumpier than I used to be. You know, at times it's like, I'm going to take so much. And once you cross that line, you know. Anybody ever been there? It's like, no, been there, done that. I don't want the T-shirt anymore. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of the, that. I got a stack of those T-shirts like that in my closet. I'm trying to get rid of them. And uh, guys, I've got to apologize to you. Sometimes I preach on some things maybe harder than I should have because I got in the flesh as much as in the spirit. And I, I've told you before, there's just some things I won't tolerate. And I, I tell you what, I, I won't tolerate a goat in the flock anymore, not because of me, but because of you guys. You guys deserve better. This place needs to be a safe place. If, you know, if you're not safe at home and you're not safe in church, where are you going to be safe at? And God began to deal with me. He said, he said, part of the problem is Babylon has permeated everything. It really has. It has so successfully permeated everything, guys. In politics, guys, it's both liberal and conservative. Babylon has permeated everything. In finances, it's both capitalism and communism. Because you can have capitalism without ethics, and it's Babylon. In philosophies, individualism and socialism, it's all Babylon. You see, Satan has tried to set this thing up that no matter if you turn to the right or to the left, you're still in his camp. 
He really has worked hard. God in the guys in the airways. The airways are full of Babylon. The universities are full of Babylon, and the church is full of Babylon, and the synagogue is full of Babylon. Satan has has worked this thing and says, "Checkmate." Checkmate. I've got you no matter what you do, no matter where you go, everything. You know, it's just like with progressivism. You know, in 1900, we had a Republican, Teddy Roosevelt, that was a progressive that ran against a progressive Democrat. And they have so permeated both sides of the aisle that there's no choice. That's when Satan began to do a lot of things in this country. I was surprised to find out that FDR, when running against uh, Hoover, said, this guy's so progressive, he's going to make us communists, and he's going to take over, the, he's going to take over all industry, and he's going to make everything socialist. Of course, that's what he did. He just, you know, one was up here doing it, one was down here doing it. He's just going 100 when I'm going 50. That's the choice. No. There has to be another option, guys. Now, we find it, I believe, in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, Verses 1 through 4. And what I have found is God always tells us the end from the beginning. That there are parallels that we see when we read the Torah, when we read the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we we read all those stories, we find out where we are now too. It's important for us. Picking up here in verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils and every foul spirit and every cage of every unclean and hurtful bird. For all the nations are, uh, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. How many know that kind of sounds like planet earth right now? Every nation, every system. We're, 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 guys, we're in the craziest thing I've ever seen. Nations that were a free market nations like America and stuff, we're becoming more communistic every day. But yet at the same time, we look at communism in China, uh, 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 Russia and China, and they're becoming more free enterprise while still controlled by by socialistic tendencies, they're opening up the market where we're closing it down. Hmm. And we kind of wonder why all the money's going over there, but it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's the, the whole world, there's not a nation that you can go into that has not drank of this in one shape or fashion or form. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, be ye not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Come out from her. Now, what's interesting about that, you see, there was a time before that Babylon ran everything. Do you know that all of our original great cities originated in Babylon? There was a guy named Nimrod that began to build cities. He began to build fortified cities. Men, instead of depending upon God, depended upon one another for commerce begin depending upon one another. First currencies came out of Babylon. The first police came out of Babylon. The first soldiers came out of Babylon. The first free enterprise system came out of Babylon. The first organized religion, Molech and Ashtaroth, came out of Babylon. And we see it permeating everything. And then we see this guy named Abram that's living in Babylon. And not only is he a citizen of Babylon, his, his way of life, his, his very financial security is in making the idols of Babylon. And God says, I'm almighty God. That's not me. I'm me. Now come out. I don't think we fully understand the significance of that because Paul, looking at the Gentile church, began to speak of Abram, didn't he? Over and over again in the epistles, you're like Abraham, you're like Abraham, it's by faith. By faith to come out of Babylon. It's by faith that we're saved, but in the salvation process, we've got to come out so that we can go in. The one option that transcends Everything on this planet is the kingdom of God. 
I've got to come out of Babylon so that I can walk in the kingdom. I need to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit to do like Abraham. I can be in the world, but not of the world. Aren't you tired of the world telling you what's cool? Guys, you know, once you step back out of that, it is the stupidest stuff I think I have ever seen in my life. Did you know how, do you know how the Roman Empire was taken down? One of, the, one of the main reasons besides entitlements and all these different things, we can see that. The, the, when, uh, when, when Rome crumbled, about 80% of the population worked for the government because that's the only jobs to be had. Do we kind of see a, a trend here? But there, there was another underlying thing that happened. It became faddish to eat and cook with lead-made utensils, lead-made plates, lead-made pots. How many know that if you cook your stew in a pot made of lead, and you stir it made of lead, and you serve it in mugs made of lead, and, and plates made of lead, you're going to get lead poisoning. And you, and you become stupefied. It begins to affect your mental processes. And let me tell you something. There are, there are fads going on right now in the nation, in the world, that are just like those lead pots. All they got to do is make it faddish. I, I've looked at, the, at the, the homosexual community since Babylon. It has always been at one and a half to two percent of the population. Always. But now it's kind of exploding beyond that, isn't it? You know why? They made it a fad. By using Babylonian TV, you make it funny, you, you begin interjecting all these things. And a lot of times they put it in places in shows that it doesn't even really belong. Why? To make it faddish. Because people are looking to the world to make them feel significant. Or the latest fashions. Let me tell you something. Maybe it's just because I'm fat. I don't know. But this, some of that, that stuff just don't look good. You know? You know, it might look good on you. Skinny people can get away with certain things that if you have any meat on your bones, it just isn't going to work, I guess. But I look at it and I say, that's hideous. You know, with me, I take my stand. I wear a two-button jacket, these three and four buttons. Those are the craziest looking things I've ever seen. And I always go back and I say, I want the old standard. And sometimes I have a hard time finding them. There have been times, you know, Mary's went into places. She says, I buy nothing this year. This is the craziest looking stuff I've ever seen. And then you see 60 and 70-year-old women wearing this stuff. And guys, once you step back out of it, if it looks goofy on a 20-year-old, how much do you think it's going to look on a 70-year-old? And we're strutting, I'm somebody because I got the latest stuff. All they got to do is make it faddish. Here's another one. Tattoos. Everybody's got to have one. Did you know there is an extreme occultic emphasis on tattoos? It goes with pagan worship. And I, I've got a book. I'm a researcher. I want, to know, I want to know what the enemy's doing. And they will tell you, and, and this is done by tattoo artists. They're not Christians. They're, they're just tattoo artists and they're pagan or whatever. They say that a true tattoo artist is a shaman. And by the, what they, the art that they do, they're enhancing your soul. They're bringing other things in to begin to influence you by that which they put on your body. And then we kind of wonder why we have a whole generation stuck on stupid. It's because we've allowed so much of Babylon, and all they've got to do is make it to where it's popular. The church is even doing that. What, what's popular? Let me show you something. Now, I, I can't do it on the screen because our, our camera won't focus when we're doing our things. But this, this is the, the, the tabernacle, and the tabernacle is, is a model for everything. You have the throne of God and the holy of holies. You have the menorah, which represents worship and, and the study of the word in the holy place. And then you have the outer court, which is the brazen altar. All of it was centered in on the throne. Everything that was being done in the outer court and in the inner court was all about service to God. And that's so important. If you you got to labor in the kingdom to get paid by the kingdom. It's, it's got to be your employer centric. It has to be God centric. That if I labor in his vineyard and whatever he has for me to do, that I'm going to make sure that I, there's a payday coming for me in the kingdom. My needs are met when I see to it that his needs and purposes in the earth are met. 
Doesn't that make sense? But what we have done is when Babylon gets a hold, it flips around. It becomes a welfare state, if you will. How can I manipulate the system to get God to meet my needs instead of meeting them because you're his servant in the earth? Well, I tell you what now, if you give on a certain day and you face north and you hold one foot up, then God's got to give you what you need. Or I've got this revelation. Here's 50 ways to get what. And it's all about almost a welfare state type of thing. God's going God's to meet. God's going to do this. God's going to do this. How about God's already done, guys? When we look at the cross, God's already done. It's learning that when I begin functioning in the kingdom and I become God-centric in all that I do, that my family is God-centric, that I am an individual, I have stepped out of Babylon and I'm wanting to serve him and honor him, God sees to it that all my needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Whether it be I get a new job, I get a raise at work, or what I have begins to just not wear out. I mean, guys, you know, if, you don't, if, if your car isn't breaking down every minute, you have extra money for other things. If things begin to stretch in your house, you have money for other things. God, with, with me at the beginning of this year, I was beginning to believe God for a new roof, and how I many know oh, those aren't really, those are not cheap. At about the fourth hailstorm we had this year, and a big windstorm that we had, I got one for $500 instead of $8,000 because there was legitimate damage done by the weather that the insurance company came in. Now, I couldn't have planned that. You know, Mary and I were seven and said, we're going to have to believe God for eight to $10,000 for a new roof, so we're going to believe this extra money. And God says, well, I'm not limited by that. <laughs> and that shows the awesomeness of God. And just no, no, so that nobody, the, the insurance company couldn't argue because there was a path about a half mile wide that new houses, old houses, whatever, all of them were having their roofs replaced because of that particular storm. Because God can use situations. He, he can use things beyond our understanding and, 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 and to do it in such a way that I'm not giving to manipulate God. It's like almost everything in TV is, you know, you're going to give to get. When I read the word, I give because I got. That's, that's, that's the purpose of the tithe. I'm honoring him. Now, I may start with this, this little dab here, but I recognize that even that little dab, I wouldn't have if it wasn't for God. And so when I honor him and I, I keep my perspective right that, that he gives, he takes away, he does all these things in my life, and I'm not servicing this way of Babylon, then God says, you know what? I can, I can bump you up and give you a little more. Guys, in the last year or so with some people that have come through here, I've seen God double their salaries. I've seen them double their salaries. You know why? It wasn't just that they had expertise in their particular field. It's because God did enough work in their lives. They were honoring him where they were at, and that allowed him to take them where they needed to be. Increased it. But at the same time, guys, what I'm, what I'm feeling is that uh, God wants to do more. You see, there, we need to move the church from beyond a welfare state. We also need to move it beyond Greek theater. Because, it, it, uh, guys, you know, I've been all over. <laughs> and where a lot of churches, what they do with the praise and worship is they're creating an experience for you. Lights, sound effects. Some might even do fog machines. They flip it on and say, Look, the glory of God's coming in. <laughs> I mean, all these different things they're trying to create an effect for you. What we're trying to do with the way we do praise and worship is to create something for him. It's not an experience for us. Your greatest experience is when we, get, when we, when we can move the service in line with heaven so that heaven invades here. You get your experience, the right one, the presence of God. But we, we have turned so much into Greek theater. And it, guys, it, you can go to a Messianic synagogue and it still be Greek theater. Because it's about what makes me feel good, what makes me what. Because what, I, I, I hear from Messianic rabbis all the time. And some of the things that are going on and some of their concerns. We need to step out of that. 
In fact, what I thought was so neat, when Ezra and Nehemiah founded the synagogue, they always built them outside the cities. Because it was, it was a conscious, to really, do, to really serve God, we've got to step outside of Babylon. We got, we got to go outside that Babylonian system to, to really walk with God the way that we need to. And I, I think it needs to be that way again. And I know that God's getting ready to pour out some new wine. He's getting ready to do some new things. But what I'm sensing in my heart and what I'm sensing for most of the body, we are keenly aware we're not ready. We're really not ready. And I'm not talking about having facilities or having enough money or, or having this and that. This right here is not really ready for what God wants to do. So I want to go to Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, and I want to deal with the new wine and the new wine skin. And I have, I was raised in church. Every once in a while, they let me out to get food, I guess, but sometimes I think. But I, rem I remember taking naps underneath the, you know those old wooden pews? And I, I mean, I, I'm talking hardcore Baptist where they wouldn't even allow you to have a pad on the, chair, on, the, on, the, on the pews. The old, hard, solid oak wooden pews. I remember curling up to sleep during church service on one of those. And I've talked to a younger generation that's, you know, about 10, 15 years. Uh, his mama brought, you know, brought him a pallet. We didn't have a pallet. The carpet was just fine enough. And I guess maybe even for the older generation, it was either dirt or a pallet. So, you know, mama brought you a pallet. I remember doing that. So I, I've been around forever uh, in, in the church, and a lot of others have too. But just longevity in the church isn't going to prepare you for what God's going to do. You know, I've been in it forever. Well, there's also bumps and bruises you can get along the way, can't you? And I think this is, let's, let's go to this in, in verse 18, because I want you to help make sense of this, because I have heard everything that could be possibly preached about the new wine skid being preached. And, so, and whenever you take a verse out of context, you can really miss the point, can't you? And the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast, and they came uh, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and in them, in them and then shall they fast in those days. So is Jesus is Jesus physically here with us today? No, then fasting ought to be a part of the Christian discipline. But he doesn't stop there. This is all part of the same, uh, same conversation. No man shall, show, shall showeth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that is filled up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine in old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilt, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put in new bottles. And, we have, and I have seen so many ministers try to exegete this, and they say, Separate the fasting from the new wine and the new wine skin. In fact, I've, I, well, there's a book that I really enjoy. I've recommend people to read. It's called the Complete Wine Skin. It talks about the fivefold ministry and how that there is the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But what that brother failed to realize, he did not study his Hebraic heritage, and he did not know that those five offices existed in the synagogue for hundreds of years, even before Jesus came to minister. Paul was not creating five new offices. He was reaching into the synagogal model that he was familiar and trained with and extrapolated that for Gentile use. So the five-fold ministry was not the new model. Have you ever noticed when, when Jesus said, I make you my apostles, he, the, the disciples didn't say, cool, what is that? What is it, Lord? I'm glad you made it, but what is it? They already knew what an apostle was. Because for centuries, anyone sent from a synagogue to do, go out and do something, accomplish something, was an apostle. Did you know that Saul, Rabbi Shaul, when he was sent to Damascus with letters from the Sanhedrin to take believers in Yeshua captive because of their faith, he was an apostle of the Sanhedrin because he was one sent forth for a purpose. 
And as good as that sounds and, and how God is reestablishing the five-fold ministry, that is not the new wineskin. What is the new wineskin? It's you. It's your heart. Because the truth of the matter is, life is rough. Childhood's not perfect. You go back to the very first parents, Adam and Eve, and how many know, I mean, some people say, you know, Eve ate, ate Adam out of house and home, you know, and he ended up getting, getting cast out of the garden. The, the first two brothers, one killed the other. It, there, there is no perfect family. And about the time I think I may have had it rough and tough when, when I was growing up, I meet somebody that makes me look like Mary Poppins had showed up, you know, and, and, and everything was just rosy and wonderful compared to what other people have gone through. Uh, even with what uh, Mary and I went through when we were uh, doing the things that we were doing, we were having the occult come after us. Guys, we have met people that make that sound like nothing. In fact, I, I have come to... You know, when you're on the road and you're, you're driving or on the airplane, every once in a while I let the pilot actually fly the thing and I just kind of kick back and relax, you know. Um, I have a lot of time to think. And I, I've thought over the last 20 years or so, and I, I found out what actually hurt me the most wasn't people coming after me to try to kill me. It wasn't. Or people coming in, and we, we, we actually had witches come in and be a part of the congregation and then try to lay hands on people and, and try to curse them and all kinds of stuff. What brought me the greatest wound was something called disappointment. That people had the veneer of great spirituality, but it was a very thin veneer with a huge ball of carnality right in the middle. They, they adapted to a pseudo-spiritual culture but on the inside, it was all carnality. And guys, I, I've had a lot of people walk into my life that I thought, here's somebody that really walks with God that I can learn from. Mary and I have, have talked about this quandary many a times. That Here's somebody that really looks like they're a lot further along than we are in God, and they kind of got their act together. And since I'd like to get mine together, really, I'd like to have a mentor. I'd like to have an Apostle Paul come in. I'd like to have this come in. And when you really get to know them, they're in worse shape than we were. And it's like... And I remember praying one day, and I said, God... When am I going to have a Lester Summerall? I mean, I, guys, I even had it set up. I was going to get to meet Lester Summerall. One of my graduates uh, was second, was second with, at um, Free Worship Chapel under, under uh, uh, Jensen Franklin. And so he said, Mike, I want you to fly in because I've got to go and pick Lester Summerall up, and you're going to be in the car with him for two and a half hours. I thought, glory to God. I'm gonna I'm gonna come out of the back of that the back of that vehicle, woohoo! You know, just to be able to spend that time just talking about the things of God, and had that all set up. And two months earlier, he had passed away. Went on to uh, to be home with God. I'm thinking, okay, now what? You know, and so I I was praying, and God said, "Why don't you just become a Lester Sumrall? Why don't you just become a mentor?" And guys, I've, I've really been working on myself ever since there. Am I there yet? No, because I need a new wineskin. There, there's some things that God's wanting to pour out in all of us. We've been searching and searching, searching, whether it be via occupation, whether it be via church, or, or this teaching, or that teaching. I mean, there's a lot of Christians running all over the place for every new thing. And the reason they're doing it is they know they're not whole. They've been roughed up. They've been lied to. And what they need is a new wineskin. You see, one of, the, one of the things that Jesus was dealing with here, you know, if Jesus was physically here, I mean, everything would be okay. He would help me deal with my issues. He would, he would bind up my wounds. And, I mean, he did a lot of therapy, if you will, with all the apostles. He really had his hands full with Peter, you know, all the time. He, even when he was being betrayed, he had to stop, heal a guy, put his ear back on, say, now, Peter. <laughs> 
I mean, he had his hands full, but he was able to maintain and to create an environment that they could ask questions, that they could be restored. And he said, they don't need to fast. I'm here. But he said, you know, I'm getting ready to give my life for mankind. I'm, I'm going to resurrect from the dead, and I'm going to ascend. And now after my ascension, they're going to have to learn to fast again because there's going to be some times in their life that they're going to need a new wineskin. And, you know, when we think of wine in today's, you know, you either think it comes in a box or it comes in a bottle. Back then, it, 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 sometimes they would, would take the, the bladder of animals and create it into a wineskin, or they would, they would take uh, leather that was tanned and they would, they would, that would be their, their wine bottles. Well, how many know exposure to the world dries out leather? And exposure to the world dries out our spirit. The wounds that we receive in life toughen up and thicken our hearts. That's why over and over again, you know, Lord, create a clean heart. Re renew a right spirit within me. Lord, I know that this earth is rough and that we all go through lots of things. And the purpose of that is so that I can't become pliable in the hands of God. So that when he wants to stretch me, I can't stretch. And guys, got, guys there, there have been times, and I've even felt in our services, we were, you know, we were at times, you know, it's like if the glory didn't come in, there, there were times it was like the glory's going to come in a minute, we can just step on into heaven. It was, was that wonderful. But there was, there was a pause to it. And I thought, well, there's this sin in my life, sin in somebody's life. God, why, why aren't you coming in the way that I know that you can, the way that I sense in my spirit that you can? And it was the mercy of God, not necessarily for our sins, but for our wounds. I'm not pliable enough in that area. If God would have come in and stretched me out, I would have burst. And I think with every new move of God, God does a new move. He begins to pour out a new wine just in time. That the church needs it, that his body needs that new wine. But at the same time, what he's got to do is he has got to begin to work on us to begin giving us a new wine skin because the reason we need that new wine is that we're hurt. We've been let down. We've been, we've been guys, I, I've been lied to. I, I, I have been manipulated. I, I have, I, in, in just ministry with the school, I have, I have seen everybody promise me everything. I mean, I, I should have a Learjet. I should have a 2 or $3 million building. I mean, I, I should have all these things over the last 30 years that people just promised me with the school. Okay. And so when you really get what you got after the promises, <laughs> it's right here. That's it. I, I've seen them go from that to uh, the, the new thing is the sob story. It's almost like the guy who's out begging on the street saying, you know, out of work or whatever. And then when he gets all that cash in that uh, he doesn't have to notify the IRS about, he goes around the corner, gets in his Mercedes as he drives off. I've seen a lot of that. Where, oh, brother, I, I want to study, but I, I, I just can't afford it. Well, why can't you afford it? Well, you know, I'm paying $200 a month on my satellite bill. We eat out a lot. I have three new cars. And so they, they've went from one way to the other way. And, it, and it'll go in waves now. In a couple of years, it may flip back again. Because it's whatever to manipulate the system. And how many know in the kingdom there's no manipulation? Sometimes you need to invest in yourself. Sometimes God opens up an avenue but there's honesty there. And when, when all these things are going on, it's going on in the pulpit, it's going on outside the pulpit, it's going on in the pews, it's going on in the world, that you get dried out, you get roughed up, you get wounded, you get hurt. And I, I've noticed, guys, uh, part of it's kind of the older I get, the places where I've had surgery or I've had a wound or something, it's a little tougher there, isn't it? I, I found out gristle does show up on... <laughs> Old preachers to some places you wouldn't imagine it to be. And I found out I've got, I try to move the way that I used to move, and all it says is stop, halt, halt now, stop, 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 halt. 
And I'm thinking, but I used to be able to do that. I'm amazed that as age and the wounds take their toll, how much I can't do what I used to do. Guys, we're that way spiritually. We're that way spiritually. With the praise and worship that we had this morning, I could just get in that. And if you notice, I kind of closed my eyes because I, I really want to forget about you when I praise and worship. But it's, it's just about him. And I get there, and it's just wonderful. And I, I sense the potential of more. For, for God to do more in me and through me. And I sense it for every one of you guys. I, I, I sense the potential. But I sense Babylon is either rep- is trying to suck out that potential or trying to stop it altogether. And guys, I see a lot of... Uh, I'm going to talk about my... It, it, you guys notice I'm a hefty fella. And, and one of the reasons I am is because of everything that we went through, food has become a comfort to me. And guys, as I, as I travel, I see a lot of plump preachers that food has become a comfort to them. I didn't eat, guys, until I started traveling and hanging out with a lot of preachers, I didn't know what GERD was, acid reflux was. But Red Robin at 11 o'clock at night after a church service and you have onion rings and a, 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 triple, you know, a triple burger with jalapenos and everything else on it, I guarantee you, you may have never had indigestion in your life. You will have GERD at 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up and I was trying to rebuke demons. Went, what is this? God said, man was not created to eat that right before he went to bed. And, they, and I found out they do that because it, it comforts them. But did you know that and, and our food is killing us? Our food is killing us. We've got to draw our comfort from something besides food. And like many of us, I was a latchkey kid. My mom had to work. And I tell you what, we're in a time that mom and dad almost both have to work. It's a rarity to find them not having to work. And so TV becomes the babysitter. It really does. It just having it on, if, if you're a latchkey kid, just having it on, bring, it's like having the parent at the house. But you know what? Our TVs have betrayed us. I mean, know oh, Lucy's got some explaining to do. Because there's a lot of junk on there that Babylon is constantly flowing into us. And we didn't know it, and what used to be comforting to us is actually numbing us down. It's hazing us out. It's, it's getting us to where we're not doing the things that we need to do because I've got to have that comfort. I've got to have that comfort. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I'll never let you go. He's my comforter. You see, I found... That I can, I, I, guys, I, there have been past times I could clear out, you know, all you could eat. There's been a few times in my teenage years they said, yes, that is all you can eat for eight ninety nine. But how many know that it really doesn't comfort? Not really, it's, it's temporary. It's temporary. You can watch a good show, you can get, for a guy, every once in a while you just need to watch something blow up. It is good for the soul. <laughs> but how many know that that is a short-lived comfort because in real life it didn't? <laughs> the bad guys didn't get defeated in the 35 to 40 minutes, you know. They, 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 you go back out and the same enemies you had are really still there. And every once in a while it's good to diffuse, but a whole diet of that, then you never get the strategies from God to take care of the real enemies. In fact, if you're not careful, they will spood feed you the philosophies of the enemy to where you find out you start acting and thinking like the very enemy that you once stood against. Guys, this morning I'm having a discussion with me and I'm just kind of letting you in on it. That I need to change 
my direction in fasting. You see, in the, fa- in the past, we have fasted for revival. How I many know we've been fasting about the election? We've been fasting about the economy. We've been fasting for a lot of things. But what Jesus was saying here is there's coming, there's, there's, there's seasons in your life that you need to fast for a renewed heart. You need to fast for God to give you a new wineskin. You need to fast for him to, to work out the, the hard places in your life, the hurts that you have here. I have found, guys, that there is no hurt deep enough that Jesus cannot reach. There is no disappointment so great that he can't overcome it. I remember my, my stepdad, and there were a lot of times my mom wasn't around when he did this, but I, I've got a pretty decent IQ. And my whole childhood, I was told just how stupid I was, how I would never amount to anything ever. And I was sitting in my office with four doctorates on the wall, feeling stupid. Because the, the, the truth of who you are, education can sharpen the tools, but it can't give it to you. It comes from the hand of God. Okay. There are many people that are didactic or self-trained that far exceed many PhDs coming out of some of the universities today. And I, I, I was sitting, and I'm, I, it's like, God, I've done it again. I, I've self-sabotaged myself again. I, I've been stupid again, Lord. And, and I know I, I should know better than what I did. And yet I find myself doing it again because the echoes of those words of the past were defining my now. And I, I was sitting in my office. And I, boy, I can remember it because it's just as real. God walked into that office. And he said, I'm your father. Now let me say some things over you. And I literally felt the hands of God rest on my shoulder. I tangibly felt it. And God began to speak to me who I was. And did you know that in that instant, in that probably didn't last more than two, three, or four minutes, it erased 30 years. In that one area, God gave me a new wineskin. And I've not felt stupid since. I've not, I've not felt inadequate since. Because of just in that one moment. In that one moment. How many places in our life that we need God to come into that one moment and to speak something to us? To do something in our lives. That's what Jesus was talking about here. Jesus was physically there. When Peter put his foot in his mouth, Jesus was there to pull it out. When, Jesus, when, when Peter cut off a guy's ear, Jesus was there to put it back. When Peter was sinking in the water, Jesus was there to grab him up by the hair. But, you know, later on, Jesus wasn't there to do it. Peter had to learn to take his own foot out of his own mouth and apologize and to, and to say, you know, I, I'm apt to do that, but you know what? God's working on me. And then he let the Lord work on him. And Peter got to the place where he was walking so close to God that if you could get near the shadow, you were confronted by the kingdom. You see, that's what I want. I, I, I want... Babylon not only to get out of me, but I want the wounds and the dirt and the filth and the and the uh, the scars of Babylon to be lifted off of my soul so that I can stretch the way that God wants me to stretch. You see, there's some of us here today that God's wanting to stretch you in a new direction, but if you if you do it right now, you'd bust. You'd bust because that area. You see, Satan is strategic. He knew that if God was ever going to take him, I'm, I'm going to scar that thing up. I'm going to hurt. I have found out some of the people that have been the most abused, that normally would, would be so full of rage, is because Jesus called them to move in compassion. Jesus called them to move in love. And they would be the first ones to get in your face and knock you out and drag you through the streets and say, how dare you ever tell me that I can't have ketchup on my french fries? I mean, it was that bad, you know. They're just, they're just waiting to explode are the same people that once God begins to touch, they actually have the tenderest hearts. You know, all you, 
you start saying, Jesus loves me, this I know, and by the time you get to know, they go, <laughs> why? Because God called them to have a very tender heart. Those of us that God had called to be builders, Satan saw to it that they were so wounded they couldn't build anything. And we're in a season right now that I think God is calling us the fast. I really think the election is set. God's going to have his way. Now, for every believer, I'm going to say the same thing that uh, Bonhoeffer said when they were voting to make Hitler Chancellor of Germany. To not vote is to vote. You better vote your faith and you better vote your convictions. And there's no excuse not to vote because we're in a nation where we actually have the right to vote. If we vote and we pray, we can expect God to take care of it. But I, th I think the fasting that we need to do now is fasting for the restoring of our soul. Because God wants a people that are whole that he can move through. This next great thing that I think God's going to do, and I, some people say, well, you know, we're, we're already probably in the tribulation period. Maybe, but I still think God wants to flip this thing for one last great revival before he hands it over to hell. Because there has to be a clear choice. And for the last 20 years, has the world really had a clear choice of who Jesus was? Mary and I have, have lost sleep over, you know, the videos that we, we put out and the stuff we put out. Somebody gets saved, where will we put them? Even if, I mean, if they're a thousand miles from here, where would I pick up the phone and say, in this fellowship, you'd be safe and you'd be taught the truth? That this, you know, it's not some emergent church thing looking for some fat. It's actually seeking the face of God. We'd be hard pressed to do that at times. But I think God's beginning to change some things. And God is separating to where it's going to be clean and unclean, holy and unholy, righteous and unrighteous. Seek in him, squirrel, and darkness. This is only going to be the three, only three choices. You step up the menu in the kingdom. These people, I don't care what the name is over the door and whether they meet on Sunday or Sabbath, they're still trying to keep the commands. They're still trying to really walk with God, and God is adjusting them because they're seeking his face. And then those that are just after the latest fad, after the new squirrel, that can cause some excitement in the church. And then those that are going to be going more and more and more into darkness. And as we approach that, God needs to work in us so that we're ready to facilitate in his kingdom. You know, I, I had a, a lot of things I, I wanted to end this message with today. You know, and I've actually got on my iPhone, I said, well, I want everybody to pray, and so I want to do an altar call. I don't know necessarily if I want to do an altar call this morning. I'm trying to plant the seed that God will be able to do what he does as we begin to fast. And in the fasting process, we're going to have some altar calls, but you can't do it before the fasting starts. There may be services, guys, coming up, and I'm going to warn you, I may not get to preach at all because we just may get into seeking the face of God during the praise and worship, and I'm just going to let it stay there. What could I add to the presence of God? What could I add to it? How about just letting it work out and we'll, just, we'll come and turn seats around and, and, just, and just seek the face of God and pray. But what, I, what I'm saying is I'm declaring a fast. This is a declared fast for a while. And it may be I'm going to fast so much TV a week. I'm going to fast so much food a week. And maybe God, you know, I, I had a preacher go into panic when I was, when I was at uh, Tabernacles. And I said, God may be calling you to, to fast coffee. The brother turned white. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, part of it, he was kidding. But it's one of those knows he was kidding. But no, he was not kidding. I'll give up food. Just don't make me give up coffee. <laughs> And just replace those times of just seeking God. And you, you have to, whenever you believe God for something, whenever you're fasting, you got to point your faith. It doesn't need to be nebulous. Uh, uh, it, it needs to be, God, restore my soul. God, give me a new wineskin. I want to hold your new wine. Do in me whatever you need to do. Change whatever you need to change. The army talks about being the army of one. I want to be the kingdom of one. I, I want to be the revival of one. 
work on me, renew me, revive me, do all the things you need to do, rearrange my life however you need to do it to bring me in line with the kingdom. Why is that so important? If we had 50 people that came in line with the kingdom and we came together, wouldn't we have church? We'd have the glory of God here and wouldn't need a switch to switch it on so that it could kind of roll in, guys. It would be here. And that's what God is talking about. If we're, if we're really where we need to be with what God's wanting to do, we could have sinners come in here and not affect the service. The service would affect them. I don't care what they're doing. We could have Illuminati members come in here and they would find out what illumination is all about. And they would find out just how much of darkness they were in because what God has done in us, it, it, it's like hot coals. One hot coal can do so much, but you get two hot coals together and they do a lot more. If you pile up 50 hot coals, you can shape an iron. You can transform iron itself if you get enough hot coals together. And our prayer needs to be, Lord, make me that hot coal. Do in me what you need to do so that you can pour the new wine in me. And I guarantee that as God does it in your lives, he's going to do it in my life. The, e the easiest way for me to get deep in my teaching is for you to already be deep. I can't go deep when everybody's playing in the kiddie pool. I can't do it. I have went into fellowships. God says, keep it shallow. You'll drown them. So when I wanted to go this deep in a subject, I'm just able to go right here because that, that's all that they can bear. But I mean, I'm hungry for more. Aren't you hungry for more? And as God restores us, and as we seek him, see, th this, this really kills the flesh because how many of us have heard in church, you know, the preacher's preaching really good, really hard, and they said, boy, Jim needed to hear that. Jim wasn't there. You know what that is? That's deflection. Well, they really need that. I tell you what, that would have really straightened them out. Well, God was trying to do straighten you out because you're the ones here this morning, and I've done that myself. You know what my my thing is as a, as a preacher when I hear something and it's really stepping on my toes and I can begin to hear the crunch. Instead of yielding to it, I said, "Boy, that'll really preach." <laughs> you see, each one of us have our own propensity to deflect what God is doing. And what we need to do is stop the deflecting and start the receiving. Because we deflect because of our wounds. We deflect because of our pains and our hurts and our scars. God's wanting to move us back. That, that, that is the time that we're in right now. God is saying to prepare for 2013, you got to have that new wineskin. You got to start praying for you in a non Babylonian way. It's not, Lord, give me that Lexus. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. It's, Lord, I need a new wineskin. I need a new heart. Create within me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew it within me. There's so much more of you I want to hold. There's so much more of what you're doing that I want to hold. And each one of us have something different to fast. You know what it is. It's the thing when you think about it, you go, <gasps> I've got a whole list of, <gasps> I'm going to start working through that list myself. Because there's nothing that I could ever give up that can compare to what God wants to do in my life. Nothing. And to be open for him to give you instruction. As we fast, we observe, we, we look. God, what are you going to begin to tell me? What am I going to be able to see that I've not seen before? And to begin implementing it in my life. Don't share it with a soul. It's not for them, it's for you. I don't want you to deflect. I want you to apply. Because after we go through this season, 
Everyone that I believe that hears this, whether it's on YouTube or whatever, everyone that hears it, when, you, when we end this season, we're all going to be standing here with new wine skins ready to be filled up. That's what I want more than anything. I want to be filled up with something new from God. Not hype, but holiness. Not marketing, not, not all the things of Babylon, but just flowing in God. A revival looking somewhere to happen. When you're on fire, you start catching other things on fire around you. That's what we want. Father, I just thank you for this word this morning. Father, we confess that we are battered, we are wounded, we have been roughed up by life. And Father, it's caused the, the skin of our hearts to be tough where you couldn't really mold it and flow the way that you've needed to. Father, we have set our hearts, as Jesus instructed us, to fast for that new wineskin. Father, we enter into this with, with reverence, with respect for you. And Father, we just ask that the Holy Spirit, as we begin seeking your face and to fast before you, that every wound is going to be healed, every scar is going to become as new flesh, Father so that you can move through us. Father, don't let the past determine our future. But Father, our future needs to be set and determined by you and by your kingdom and by who you are and nothing else. And Father, I just loose an anointing in this place today to begin that journey. Father, to begin seeking your face for that new wineskin. Father, for that new right spirit within us so that we can flow in your kingdom. Father, I thank you, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name.